What's up, everybody? How we doing this morning? Everybody alive and well? Hey, it's beautiful outside. It's colder than you can imagine, but it's awesome. Isn't it a beautiful day? Well, hey, today I am excited you're here. Thanks for being here this morning. I got some things I want to share with you. At least I didn't fall down this week or trip on my guitar, which is a win always. If you weren't here a couple weeks ago, I tripped and all kinds of wonderful things were taking place. Hey, here we go. But I'm excited you're here. Um, I got some things I want to share with you that I really feel are going to be uh, uh, really good for this season of our life. Um, I don't know um, where you are in your walk with God and how, and how you um, function with Him and what you struggle with and all those. But how many knows that we all struggle? We all have things that we walk through that, that are difficult or things, the challenges we face. We just can't seem to get around them or get a hold on them. So this morning, I want to kind of focus on some things like that. So if you will, really quick, let's just close our eyes and, and let's just get our hearts uh, focused upon Him. Lord, we just, uh, we give you our attention this morning, our full attention to know that whatever it is that you're gonna say today, you're gonna say it, and it's going to bring life and hope. I pray for everybody in the room that no matter where they are currently, what they're struggling with does not define them. It does not determine what it is that you're doing in their life. And so I pray today that all those, those, those strongholds of our mind that hold us captive would today just be broken down uh, in our minds because you've already broken them down uh, in reality. So today I pray that our minds would be able to be open and to receive what it is that the Spirit of God is saying today. So we do all of this today for your glory and because of who you are. So we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, say amen. Hit your neighbor and tell him, get ready. I don't know why I said that. I just kind of felt like I need to tell you that. Hebrews chapter 3, if you got your Bibles, we're going to start there. We're in a series called Change the Subject. We're trying to change the way that we see God um, uh, for years and generations, we've been seeing God a certain way. It's really easy for religion to creep into uh, relationships. It's really easy for um, repetitiveness to creep into normal relationships. And so what we do is we've got to be intentional about uh, how we see God, how he sees us, and know how he sees us. Because if we're not, uh, it just becomes a, a routine of life. And uh, relationships are any, anything but routine. I don't know if you know that. You know, there's routines about it. There's things that we do repetitively, but the reality of what they do and how they express to us are totally different. So um, so today I want to kind of unpack some things. Uh, first question I had this is, is, as a kid, did any of you guys struggle with obedience as a kid? Some of you that did never get in trouble, you know, you guys think you're better than we are. But I was one of those kids that, uh, uh, we got spanked. I don't know if you guys got spanked. We got spanked. I got spanked a lot. Um, and, and, and I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why, I, why I, I didn't listen. But I struggled with obedience. Uh, so just to kind of lead into this thing, whenever I was, I was probably 13, 14 years old, we kind of lived out in the country, lived in Locust Grove. And, and so we lived in the country, so we lived down like a mile or so dirt road. So there was really no other traffic because nobody lived on this road but us. And so uh, I remember that, that when I was about 13 or 14, you start getting that bug to drive. Well, because we lived out in the country, they would let me drive down the back road to the house and stuff like that. Well, well there'd be times that they would leave and they would have to tell me, hey, listen, don't be driving the cars. Okay. And, and so I would always go out and drive the cars. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, but you had, to, you had to be methodical because, you know, you couldn't drive too much gas out because they would recognize. So my sister was two, two, basically two years older, two and a half years older than I was. So she was already driving. So I'm like 14. And so she had a car. She had a little Grand Prix. And my sister's very patient about when she wants something, she'll wait until she gets that thing. Me, I'm like, you just give me a car. Does it have wheels on it? I'll take it. She's like, no, I want this car. It's got to have this window, all this stuff. So she waited for this car. It was a Grand Prix. And I remember uh, she left it at the house one day, and they went and did something. And so they were going to be gone for a while. You know, you didn't have cell phones or trackers, so you just kind of had to take a shot, you know, if you were going to do something. So I remember, I remember I would usually drive this old truck that we had, but Amber left her car there that day. And so I thought, oh, let's drive her car. So I drove her car, you know, I backed out, you know, I turned the radio on like you're really cruising. Back in the day, we cruised Main Street. I don't know if you guys ever did that or, you know, but we, so I was just like, kind of act like I was cruising, yeah, you know, driving by myself. I don't know what I was doing, but no deer or anything were out there to wave at. So I was just driving. I was like, this is so cool. So I was driving back to the house and, and 
I was parking around the front of our house and, and, and I, we have a, we had a propane tank, a big propane tank. And I remember, I don't know what was going on. I was probably just singing or jamming to something. And the next thing I know, boom, I hit, I hit that propane tank. And I was like, oh crap, you know, and I put it in park and turn it off. Like, you know, you're looking around like, did anybody see that? And so I jump out of the car and I turn and look and she has got a scratch on her front bumper. Now, you may be like, well, it's not that big of a deal. It's not noticeable. Amber noticed everything. And so I was like, okay, I gotta go back inside. So I got back in the house, you know, and then so it was like a day or so. And then they were out doing something. She's like, hey, what happened to the front bumper of my car? Somebody hit it. I was like, like a 14 year old answer. I don't know. Wasn't me. You know, like you get real defensive and it should have been a giveaway that is like, it's me. But I was like, it wasn't me. I don't drive your car. And I don't think she knew that until I was like in my 20s that I actually drove the car, that I actually admitted to it because, you know, she'd probably forgiven me by then. <laughs> but, but I remember doing that and just hiding that. Now, the problem was, is why, why did I have a hard time just not driving the car, right? Because I never thought I would wreck. I never thought I would run into something and it would cause a problem. I was like, I'm a good driver. Been driving on these dirt roads for years now. You know, what's going on? And this, that day, you just messed up. And then I was like in a bind. And so, but, and so I lied. And how many knows that when you start lying, you got to keep on lying because they figure something out and then you got to build on that lie. And then you, then you kind of forget what lie you told because truth's easy because it's real. Lies, you got to remember what you lied about and how you made up the story. So anyway, so long story short, I, I was like, what, what, why did I do that? Why did I struggle obeying? So you may be looking at your walk with God and asking yourself, why do I have a hard time following what he He's, he asks of us, why is it hard for me to not get mad at somebody? You ever thought about that? Why is it hard for me to not want to chew somebody out or to show them some sign language when they drive by and they're doing those things? Why is that hard? Why is it hard for me to not respond the way that, that I know I shouldn't respond and I want to respond good, but why do I not? And I think that that's, that's, a, that's a valid question. Hebrews chapter three is going to kind of get us into this place of seeing why we struggle obeying. Because in church, this is how we would teach it in church. You just got to do what God says. Quit being rebellious. Quit being knuckleheaded and just do what's right. Come on, anybody ever been taught that? Go to church, you're like, just do the right thing, geez. Then you got those people that have no problem doing the right thing and then they're just like, yeah, do the right thing. You're like, you know, whatever. And the reason, I mean, this is the thing about people that do the right thing. They usually just do the right thing in front of other people. But they're struggling doing other things wrong. You know, and, and uh, that's one thing that we're really going to dive into because the reality of it is, is we all struggle with obedience because it's what we believe. So Hebrews 3, let's dive into this and then we're going to kind of dig in. Now, I want you to know this. It wasn't just my parents that were like, don't be driving. It's the entire world sees it that way, right? I mean, the entire world's like, you can't drive to your 16. But for some reason... I, I, I felt like, and, and this is probably the reality of it, is I didn't trust in the goodness of my parents. That whenever I became a right age or when they were there in the right moments, that they would let me do that and I would get to drive. So I took it on myself to think, I've got to drive because I've got to feel fulfilled that I can drive, right? And so I needed to feel some value. So that's why I believe that I did that, was to feel valued. Because, you know, I was kind of the late grower, you know, so all my friends were starting to drive and I'm like, you know, bumming rides from them, you know, and feeling like a loser. And, uh, and so it was one of those things that, you know, I, well, I'm going to drive at the house. It'll make me feel valuable, right? It doesn't matter if anybody else sees me valuable. I see myself as valuable when I drive, okay? So Hebrews 3 gives us some insights. It's talking about the children of Israel coming out of bondage. And here's the important thing in Hebrews 3 that I want you to see. Because remember, they could not enter the promised land. He told them they wouldn't let them go in. And we think a lot of times it's because like he just got tired of me. He's like, you know what? No more sandwiches for you. You know, it's like, that's kind of how he felt. You guys ever watch Seinfeld? No more soup for you. You know, and so, so that's kind of like, we feel like God was is like, I'm not letting you in. You can't be in our club now because you didn't do what we said. Here's Hebrews 3, but I want you to see 
how this worked. This is verse 18 and 19. And who, to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest or the promised land, but to those who did not obey? So now we make the connection of they didn't get to enter in because they weren't obedient to him. So that's where we teach a lot of things. We'll say, yeah, and it's true. In order to walk in that goodness, there's obedience that's necessary. But what he says is, is, is we've got to understand why. And so he says that they could not. Now watch this. They would not, let me find my verse here. They would not enter his rest because they didn't obey. Now look at the next verse because it's going to open a door for us. So we see that they could not, so they would not enter because they could not enter. Now it's going to tell us why they couldn't do it. See, wouldn't do it just looks like I just don't want to. Couldn't do it means there's an ability that you're lacking that's allowing you to get there. So it says that they wouldn't do it, so it looked rebellious or not obedient because they couldn't do it. And here's why they couldn't do it, because of unbelief. So he's showing us very good insight here to the reason why I struggle obeying is because I don't believe it. Can I tell you this, that you have no problem following what you believe? None. You will do what you believe so easily that it's not even funny. You have no problem eating chocolate because you believe it, right? You have, how many have a hard time exercising? I don't believe it. But if you start seeing abs and muscles, you're like, yeah, look at this. Yeah, I'll run all the time. You know, you get it. You get it. Why? Because you start to believe that it's reality. You start to believe it's. A, so he said this about them. Because they did not believe it, they were not able to enter it. But it looks like if we teach it in a wrong way, we'll teach it like God's like, okay, you just can't come in. I'm just not letting you come in. He said the reason they couldn't come in was because they chose to believe that they couldn't because of how they saw themselves. Okay, now let's dive into this because this is important. Now, it's important to understand about unbelief because when we don't believe something, it, we struggle following it. Um, I struggled not driving because I didn't believe uh, that, that I would get in trouble or that it would cause me problems. And I wasn't patient enough to wait. And so how do I remedy that? Because it's an important thing to see because most struggle with obeying, not because we're rebellious, not because you're like, I'm just not gonna do what God says. I just don't even want to. The reason why we are struggle with unbelief is because we don't trust the source. When I don't trust the source and how the source is, then I'll struggle following it. When you trust your parents, you have no problem following them. When you don't trust them, you'll struggle obeying them. And that's, that's a simple thing, right? Why? Because I was afraid that when I got caught that my parents would say, you're never driving again. That's a 14-year-old mind, right? You're going to be grounded for six years. I might, you know, if you're like me, I was, I'm going to ground you forever. Right? As a parent, you're like, you're grounded forever. Until you're married. And that's how we were. And so our mindset's like, okay, if they catch me, they're going to say, you're never driving again. So what ends up happening is because I don't trust my parents' goodness, I struggle being trustworthy of them and believing them. So then I go about my own methods to try to find out or try to feel value, try to feel important, try to fulfill whatever need it is that I have. And that's why it's such a struggle. Now go to Galatians chapter three. I'm gonna show you some interesting things here of how this works out. Galatians chapter three. If I believe that God is withholding good from me, if I believe that he is holding back and he's not wanting goodness to come my way because I am not good enough, then I'll struggle trusting him. Galatians 3 is going to put us on a path. Also, do you believe that God is the source of your problem? Because I believe this. I believe that rebellion happens whenever I believe that the source is the cause of my problems. See, they believed really that God was the reason why they were having such a hard time. He brought them out of, brought them out of bondage, but yeah, he left them out there to die. That's kind of what they thought. So they had a hard time trusting him because they felt like he was the reason why they were in the jam that they were. And so when you don't trust the source, you won't follow him. And so they struggled with that. Now they saw him, so, because they, did, so they didn't do what he said because they felt like he was the cause of it. So if you feel like that God is the cause of your difficulty or that he's withholding good from you because you're not good enough, then you will stop trusting him. You have a hard time following him. 
But when you know that he loves you and is for you and has only good for you and that all this other stuff that happens in my life is either I've made some decisions that have caused me some hardship or this just the sin that's in the world that's bringing difficulty my way. One of the two things, but I have to believe something about God that's firm in its foundation, that he is good only. And that if he is good only, then I know he has only good for me. And if he's got only good for me, then I can trust him. Because if I don't know if he's gonna bring something bad my way, because if you're like me, they taught you like, listen, if you don't trust God, he may break your leg to teach you some humility, right? For some reason we come up with this new thing that shepherds, they'll break sheep's leg, throw them on their shoulder, be like, you're gonna learn how to do this. Now you're just gonna have a crippled sheep walking around. Why would he do that? Why would a God of all creation have to hurt you in order to get your attention? He's the biggest thing. If he just showed up in the room and was like, hey, Josh, I would probably pass out. Why? Because he's just that awesome. So why would he have to snap my leg in order to be like, hey, did I get your attention yet? You gonna start listening? I'll snap the other leg. Maybe you'll listen now. And that's kind of our view of how he works. Okay, I'm gonna give you a hardship because I can get your attention if you have a hardship. Can I tell you this? When a hardship comes our direction, he has no problem getting our attention. He doesn't have to bring it. It's gonna come. Why? Because in the world, you'll have tribulations. There'll be difficulties. Why? Because the devil's main goal is to steal from you, to kill your life, and to destroy it any way he can. Okay? So who's the source of my issue? Who's the source of my difficulty? Because of whoever that I determine that is will be whether I can trust or whether I struggle with God. Okay? Now I'm going to show you because I want you to see God in a plain view. All right? Galatians 3. Look at verse 13. I'm just going to read it up here. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Okay, let's pause right there. So when Jesus died on the cross and he was buried and he rose again, uh, because he died on the cross, he became, says here, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So on the cross, he became sin. That means this. I don't know how it worked. I don't know how he did it, but that's what he says it happened. So that's what we have to believe is he became that. He became our sin. He didn't die in a, in a place of us. He died as if he was us. Okay. That's important because it was as if you died when he died. Okay. That's, that's huge to know and to believe. And so he says this, and he took every curse what the curse was, was the curse was the, re, the response or the result of us not following him or obedience. So that means if I lied, there was a curse that would come because of that. It means like there would be an empowerment to fail. Something would come that would cause my life to fall apart. So it says this, he redeemed us. That means that when he died on the cross, he took the penalty for every lie I would tell. And you're like, so we can lie? No, that's not what that means. What that means is this, is when I don't tell the truth, it doesn't affect my relationship with him from his perspective to mine. It'll change my relationship to him because of how my mind thinks. It changes my relationships this way. When I begin to lie, it will affect my relationships with you. Why? Because I'm being deceptive, because I'm doing something to try to gather advantage my way, benefit my way, okay? So he says this, he redeemed us from all of that so that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, the promise of the Spirit, we always just talk about that being the Holy Spirit. But I want you to know it's just more than, it wasn't just the Holy Spirit, because the blessing of Abraham was this, it was a righteousness based on faith. So he says that, that blessing of Abraham, that righteousness, that the promise of righteousness by faith, that spirit of righteousness, he said would come upon us through Christ Jesus. So Jesus took the curse on him and gave us a spirit of righteousness, okay? That means this, that you now stand right with God based apart or apart from what you do. Okay, does that make sense? You guys with me so far? So he now has made us righteous. So now we stand right before him. Even if you've just lied on the way to church. Your wife's like, hey, how's my hair look? You're like, looks great. But you're actually thinking, oh, it doesn't look good at all. And you just lied to her. And, 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 and so, and then, you know, even though you did, did, that, did that, he does not look at you and say, well, I'm not blessing you now. Flat tire. Lying to your wife. No, you create distrust within yourself that way. But I thought you'd just be in loving anyway. Good lie, right? You look beautiful no matter what. Your hair doesn't even matter. Come on, that's preaching. So think about it. So he loves you apart from what you do. 
Now, when you get in the mindset of, remember, sin will kill you. So when you get in the mindset of doing things in unbelief, that's what sin is, is unbelief. I'm not trusting. It will create weirdness within your own thinking. You'll start to reject. You'll start to push yourself away from God, even though he is still right in front of you. You'll push yourself away. Why? Because you don't feel worthy. So it will mess with you. So it's not safe. It's not good to dabble in unbelief or trying to get your own fulfillment apart from him. Okay, does that make sense? Are we good so far? Verse 29, let's go a little further. I want you to see this. So we're gonna skip down. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and your heirs according to the promises. So he said, if you're Christ, if you believe on the work of Jesus, then you become born again and you are in him. So you are Christ. And he said, then you are a seed of Abraham. Then you are an heir of that righteousness and you are an heir of the promise. And not only of the the promise of righteousness by faith, but you're an heir of all the benefit that comes from right standing with God, which means every single promise in this book, okay? So I'm gonna take a topic this morning that's just really quick and I wanna throw it out there because it's gonna be one that's gonna make everybody in the room kind of sweat, okay? So I'm gonna talk about money, you guys ready for this? Talk about tithing really quick. Okay, I want to show you this. Why? Because this is a hard one. Uh, if you don't know me very well, I like to talk about these controversial things. Why? Because it just makes us all uncomfortable. We would prefer not to talk about it. But how many of us, let's talk about it because when we see and understand what it is, it makes us free. Okay? So let's talk about it. So I was raised in church that tithing uh, was this. That, you know, if you don't tithe, you're cursed, man. You will, you, he, will, he will destroy the engine in your car. Or he will open the door so that the enemy can destroy your life because you did not tithe, okay? Tithe means a tenth, a tenth part, okay? So let's go to Malachi because we're going to read that because this is what we use, okay? So I'm going to show you this. Now, I want to show you this because this is what we do because this is how we work in church. We, we, remember, we ditch to ditch drive. We either accept all of it or then we go over to the other extreme where that's not even real anymore. We don't even believe that, okay? Which is the worst place to be because it's actually the truth is in the middle of that, okay? So we got to stay in the middle and we got to find out what it's based upon through Jesus, okay? So this is what it says in Malachi. Will a man rob God, right? Yet you've robbed me. You say, in what way have we robbed you? Tithes and offerings, right? So what he's saying, if you don't give tithe, you're robbing God. So that's what we teach. So then everybody feels guilty because if you're not tithing, you're robbing God. Are you feeling uncomfortable yet? Okay. So then we can say, well, you need to, you need to, because if you don't, you're robbing God and you don't want to rob God because, right, he'll throw you in jail. You're cursed with a curse for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. So now you're cursed because you robbed God. Bring all the tithes of the storehouse. There may be food in my house. Try me now in this. Okay, so he's, he's given us kind of a challenge. Try me in this. Says the Lord of hosts, I'm gonna open for you the windows of heaven, pour you out such blessing that there's not room enough to receive it. I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the veil, or the, sorry, the, veil, the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, so we got two little conflicting thoughts here. If you do this, He'll do this. He'll open the windows of heaven. He'll pour you out blessing. You got room enough to contain it, right? That, is, that sounds awesome, right? I'm, gonna, I'm doing it. So I started tithing. Why? Because I didn't want to be cursed, right? They want to be cursed and he's going to start opening up windows of heaven. And I thought, man, I'm going to start tithing because here comes the windows of heaven opening up. The vowers being rebuked, all this stuff. And you know what I thought? I'm going to get more money. God is going to just start giving me more money. Why? Now, how many of you have believed the exact same thing I did? You're not going to raise your hand because you're like, nope. <laughs> okay, do it. You're cursed. No, okay, so now here's the, here's the reality. So that was true according to the law. But, you know, God instituted, that was instituted way before even Abraham tithed whenever he got the spoils. He just gave the Lord, the Lord blessed him. And then God instituted it as a law. Why did he institute it as a law? Because in order for him to bless them, he, they had to obey, Right? That was truth. You had to obey in order to connect to it. That's just the truth. Now, what he's trying to show us is now, when Jesus came on the scene and he died on the cross and he died, was buried and rose again, that Jesus fulfilled the law to be right with God. So what he's trying to show us is in order to be blessed this way, you did not have to tithe to be blessed because Jesus fulfilled that. So now the only criteria to be blessed of the Lord is faith in Jesus, right? So that means this, if I trust in the Lord, he will bless you. So now here's what our mind says. Tithing's no more. That's not what that says. 
But then you're like, okay, so if I don't, then no, this, you got to understand how the scripture works. Because this is what we do. We take one and throw it away, and then we're like, okay, it's no more. So let me ask you this question. Do you think that forgiveness works any differently now that Jesus died on the cross? Or do you think you still have to allow forgiveness to work through you? There's a reason why. Why? Because there's reality and truth to it. There's truth to why God did things because there's things that work when you do them. For example, this. If I know that Jesus died for me and I don't have to tithe to be right with him, there's a thing that will happen is if I'm not careful about my thought process. This is what will happen. I will only focus on me. Here's the danger of finances because finances are the substitute for God in the earth. So for example, if I was to say, hey, listen, give me your problems and would your problems be solved? How would you solve them? Probably a majority of your answer would be if I just had more money. So guess what becomes the thing I need most in my life? Money, right? So there's, there's the idea. So what God is trying to do is say this, is I'll bless you. I'll bring good your way. I'll bring financial good your way. What are you gonna do when it comes into your hands? These are principles that work, but you gotta understand this. Am I trusting the principle because uh, of the principle or am I trusting Jesus and I'm not concerned about the result? Because this is what we'll say. I'm gonna do this because I need some more money. Can I tell you this? Your answer is not because you need more money. The answer is Jesus, this needs to be the source of your life. And when he's the source, you don't have to worry about that other stuff. So is it good to do this or is it good to not good? It's good. Why? Because there's benefit to it. You see the benefit of it. Can I tell you what happens when generosity becomes a part of your life? You no longer fear financial things. You no longer fear those things. Can I tell you this? You start talking about your money, you'll get more defensive, you'll get more upset. It will cause more fights in a marriage than anything else. Why? Because it is God in a lot of situations. So what he's trying to do is say this. When he brought this principle, he was just simply saying this. Hey, there's this thing called money that you're using and it's going to be a difficulty. But here's a, here's a principle that I want you to exercise. Do this and it's about putting me first. If you put me first, watch this. This is what's gonna happen in your life. When you put me first, it's, a, it's an element of trusting me. And when you trust me, here's the benefit of that. It's not that he's up there saying, okay, when you do that, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna rebuke the devourer. The devourer has been defeated. He's been overcome. He's been wiped out. But there's still a benefit to doing this. Are you seeing, are you seeing what we're trying to do here? Why is there a benefit to this? Because if you're not generous, you will become selfish. You see, the, you see the difference. See, what we'll do is we'll say, well, we don't have to do anything. Well, then what happens if I'm not in a generous heartedness about things or I'm not seeing Jesus as generous? I'll close up my heart of compassion. Because the moment that people hear death in Christ, they'll say, I don't have to do anything any longer. That's not what that means. It means you don't have to do those things to be right with God. But there's still benefit in them because of that. Can I tell you this? You don't, have to, you don't have to like that person to be right with God, but it will affect your life here. If prosperity and, and you want to have a prosperous life, generosity is a huge part of that. It's a huge part of it. Okay, now, now what does that mean? What am I trying to say? Okay, let's dig in here. So what did the death, burial, and resurrection do? Go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. Watch this. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died in vain. So he's trying to show us that through Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection, uh, you were crucified with him. And he said, when you're crucified with him, the most important thing to do is not set aside the grace of God or the power of God, which means this, it's no longer I that lives, but it's the Christ that lives in me, okay? Now, what does that mean in our life and what did he do? Because this is kind of an important thing because we know that Jesus died for our sins, but really, what does that mean? I wanna dig into that really quick. So when Jesus was on the cross, he became sin. Now, that's kind of a generic term, so you have to kind of identify it. What that means is he became every bit of unbelief. He became every sickness. He became AIDS. He became cancer. He became drugs. He became drug addiction. He became alcoholism. He became every single thing that you could possibly be. Pornography, perversion, you name it. He became 
bet. And he bore it all for all time. Everyone on him on that tree. Can you imagine the weight of that? Holy moly. But he became that. See, it's easy just for us to say sin because it's kind of generic and we don't really identify, but we have to identify because if we don't identify, then we don't understand actually what he did on the cross. He became sin. Not only did he be sin, I'm gonna show you what it did in Isaiah. Watch this. This is Isaiah 53. Watch this. This is verse uh, four and five. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. That means sickness and our pains. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. So he was bearing our pains. He was bearing our sicknesses. Every pain that you went through in your life, he was bearing that on the cross. The suffering for it, all those things, okay? Go to verse 11, I believe it is. 10, and yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. This is it's interesting, I don't understand this, but it pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. He's talking about us. So he says this, Jesus bore all those things. Why? He bore the sickness in his body and he suffered three days in the belly of the earth for that. Meaning he paid the price for that in that suffering for three days. As a man, he dealt with that. We'll talk about that soon. So that means this, whatever it is that you're facing right now, that's difficulty or a challenge or struggle. Jesus bore on the cross and paid for it when he spent three days and nights in hell. Now, why is that important to us? Because there's a resurrection part of this. Now, when he was raised from the dead, this is, this is huge, okay? Jesus had to be healed of every sickness, every disease, and every pain, and every struggle before he could come out of that. We just think it was like, okay, he automatically, boop, there he is, he's good. He had to be healed of it, why? Because he was it. And because he healed him, now we have the ability, because let me just show you this. If it was just Jesus being Jesus and not being a man, then it means nothing to us because we could just say, well, that was Jesus, right? He was healed of sickness, why? Because he was Jesus. But he was just a man like we were. Remember, he stripped himself of all his humanity, it says, and I believe in Galatians. He became a servant and he became us, why? Because man had to bear that, why? Because man brought the problem on. And Jesus had to be healed of all those things. And he had to raise from the dead by trusting that God would raise him from the dead. This is all scriptural. And because he raised him from the dead, all of that now has been paid for and dealt with. That means every sickness has been paid for. Every pain has been paid for. That means this, when someone hurts me, that pain has already been paid for. So I don't have to make somebody pay for it makes me feel good if they pay for it, but it doesn't help me. Why? Because we think if they pay for it, it'll bring healing to me, but it doesn't. What brings healing to me is trusting that Jesus is my healer, not the person, not their situation. Why? Because they'll hold you hostage for years. You waiting for them to apologize to you instead of just being free. Does that make sense? So not only that, so let's get back to the, the, the generosity thing. So it wasn't just sickness and disease. He also paid for everything. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, watch this. You probably didn't know this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So this is just a financial example. It says that Jesus was rich, right? Because he came from heaven, so he had everything. He became poor. He became like us in this earth. And he died the death of poverty and took on poverty on the cross. And he went to hell and paid for poverty in the grave. And he raised so that you and I could become rich. Your mind's like Land Rovers and mansions. Okay, right? That's what we think, right? Land Rovers and mansions now. We, let's bring it on, Jesus. Prosperity gospel. Well, let me just show you something. I believe that God wants you to have everything your hearts desire. Now watch this. But it can't be something that fixes you. See what I'm saying? Why do I want that? A good dad would ask the question, why, right? I want this, why? Well, if I have that, people would be like, wow, look at that car, look at that. They look amazing. I bet they're wealthy. I bet they have a great life, right? 
Why would I want something? And I believe that that's what the question is. Why do I want this? Because the reality of it is, is you have everything you need in Christ. What does that mean? That means this, you'll be totally satisfied. So whatever you decide to do in life, whatever direction you go, whatever car you like, whatever this, doesn't make one bit of difference. Why? Because you're totally satisfied. I used to think all those things mattered. Why? Because I thought, man, you know what? That looks successful. And people would say, look at Jesus, how successful he is. Can I tell you, nobody looks at that like that. That's just us. We think that. But I'm telling you, the peace of God comes through what Jesus did on the cross. He was raised. Now, why am I telling you this? Because it's hard to obey him if you don't believe he has good for you. It's hard to obey him and walk in forgiveness if you don't think that he is going to solve that problem. If you don't think that he's going to work in that situation, it's hard to follow him. If it's hard to forgive somebody if you don't think they're going to get it, that things don't change for them, right? Because they're going to be rude to everybody. If I don't tell them they're rude, they're going to be rude. So I need to tell them they're rude, right? And if you don't believe that God's going to work in them, then what we'll do is we'll try to satisfy it ourselves. I have to trust either he can do it or I can do it. I don't know about you, but I've been trying to solve my problems a long time. And I have not gotten a whole lot uh, better than I was. I've just gotten better at working them, right? I got a little bit better at manipulating people. Ooh, hit your neighbor and say, that was good. <laughs> yeah, I got better at manipulating. Okay, let's dive in because we're about, we're about done, okay? Does anybody here actually get distracted uh, with stuff to fix your situations? I'm not gonna look. So let me just ask you, figure out the problem that you have in your life. You actually don't even have to figure it out. You know what it is. You actually probably carrying it when you came in this morning. Uh, how would that be fixed in your life? Don't, don't say it out loud. Just answer it to yourself. So the problem you have right now in your life, how do you think it would fix? And think about how you think it would fix and what would fix it and how would it get fixed uh, if just this. I probably would guarantee a lot of it would be somebody changing or more money would come into our life. Maybe more money and somebody changing together, that person sitting next to me. <laughs> Let's just be honest, right? I mean, it's, a, it's not like we're like, we just love everybody. No, it's hard. Why? Because you live with them all the time. Now check this out. So if that's the fix, so, so then we're, we're on a search to try to figure out how God can bring more of this into our life. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna work the tithe principle. I'm gonna work this, why? Because we go over money, they'll solve our problem. Can I tell you this? No matter what you do, there's people that have tithed all their life. I used to tithe all the time and it feel like nothing got changed. Why? Because I was trusting the principle. It had nothing to do with Jesus. I was trusting the principle because I was needing more money because I thought that would make my life better. But actually I was just miserable with maybe a little bit more money. And it just amplified my misery. So what is the answer? It's to find out what Jesus did and how much he loves you and what he has done for us so that we can trust that, okay? So this is what's interesting. Jesus already fixed whatever it is that you are battling. He's already solved it. He already overcame it. He already brought victory to it. The hard part is for us to believe that he has already done that and it's in us. Okay, that's the difficult. Go to Hebrews chapter four and I'm gonna show you what I'm talking about. Hebrews chapter four. Okay, ready? Here we go. Let's dig in here. Can I tell you how you realize if, if, if you're trusting the principle or not? If you said, God, I'm doing this and how come this is not working? You're trusting the principle. You're trusting, God, I've been doing this. I've been, I've been walking in love. I've been being nice to them and they're still rude. Well, look how you feel. Look how your fruit is responding to that. Why? Because really you're trying to fake the niceness so that things will get better. But you actually really don't believe that you like them or you want good to happen to them. Is that okay to just be really honest about that? And because I don't really like them or want the good thing to happen to them, I don't really want it to change unless they change. And then I'll change. But the reality of it is, is when they change, I'll just be like, I was right. Am I, just, am I talking truth or am I just like totally talking about myself? Okay, so how do we do this? Hebrews chapter four, look at verse one, watch this. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to fall short of it. So he says there's a promise of resting, of entering his rest. He said, let us be fear. He said, be afraid to not enter the rest that God has brought us. Two, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, 
But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he said, so I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So he's saying this, they didn't enter in even though I told them this land is your land. This land is our land. He told them this land is your land and I will conquer. You just go possess it. They're like, nope. Not going to happen. Why? Because you're just trying to kill us. Right? I'm just trusting you, God. Everybody thinks I'm a fool out here just trusting you. And so they're like, they're going to kill us. Why? Because that's how they viewed themselves. That's how they viewed God. So therefore, they believed that God was just bringing them out here to kill them. So he says this, they heard the same word of deliverance or good news that we heard. That, hey, listen, you can go in here and possess this land and it'll bring you rest. Our rest is not a land. It's a promise that God has entered in us into, that we can trust him. He gives us his righteousness and that is a restful place for us. But he said this, it did not profit them because that what they heard, they didn't trust what they heard. Like, I don't know about that. I'm just not sure that's part of the process. Why? Because when they witnessed this, now check this out. They witnessed the supernatural things of God 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they still didn't trust him. That means this, God could bring stacks of money your direction every day and pour it into your life and it will not change whether you trust him or not. Because it has nothing to do with trusting him. What you'll say is when it runs out, I just need some more money. He said supernatural does not fix anything. So God doing something in our natural does not change whether or not we trust him. Because it has trust has nothing to do with anything other than do I trust in what Jesus did on that cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. If I do, then nothing else will matter. That will satisfy. And that will bring me through any situation that I find. Now, you, you may not believe this because of my dashing handsomeness. But I have always been insecure. I tell you guys this a lot. This is not anything new. I've always been insecure. I always felt like I wasn't good looking and all those things. Which, you know, you guys know what I mean. Good looking is just like a matter of opinion. But you know what? If you don't think you are, you don't believe that, and you read everything as if it's that or not worthy, then you look at things that way, right? So I was always like, well, my God, maybe you could strike them blind and they just won't be able to see it. Maybe they'll just see me as handsome. Then when they look at me, they're like, wow, he just like, looks like King David. Maybe they'll just see something different. Why? Because I don't trust what God says about me. Meaning this. He said, Josh, when I made you, I made you fearfully and wonderfully. Well, he's got to say it because he's my dad. Right? See, that, notice how we qualify things. Well, he's got to love me because of that. He just loves everybody, so I'm just kind of part of it. That's not what that means. It means this. When he made you, he made you unique and he made you special. There's nobody that, I don't care if you look similar to somebody, you're a doppelganger out there. It doesn't matter. You're not unique. You're no one like you on this earth or ever will be. He made you wonderfully and unique. The problem is, is we want people to celebrate us because that's how we are valued. But Jesus says this, I celebrate you all the time because I think you're amazing. Yeah, but, right? But what if I just said, you know what? That's enough. What would happen in my heart if I truly believed that I was fearfully and wonderfully made? How would that change the way I approached you? How would that change the way I approached everything in my life? Okay, so think about this. First John chapter four, verse 17, watch this. It says, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. As Jesus is right now, so are we as you sit in this chair. How is Jesus? He is perfectly righteous and he is perfectly at rest. And he says, as he is now, so are you on this planet. He said this so much if you believe this, that you could stand in the day of judgment and be bold to stand before the Lord and know that as he is, so are you. I don't know if I'm that confident. That if I walk before God right now, I could be like, I'm so happy to be here. I'd probably be like, I've messed up so many times. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? But you know what he would say? I don't know what you're talking about. Why? Because all that's been paid for through Jesus. So notice what happens when I tell you that your confidence changes, right? Because now you believe truth, which leads to grace. Grace is the power of God to do what we can't do, okay? 
I remember one time, so an interesting thing, I was speaking of people. Um, Kristen used to wear her hair, this little hairdo where she would pull it up and clip it in the back. And I remember this is early on, and I, I said one time, I said, uh, hey, I like when you wear your hair down. Right? Okay, so that did not interpret well. <laughs> because what came out, apparently what I didn't say that, I said, hey, your hair looks stupid, and can you wear, never wear it like that again? <laughs> and didn't say anything, just kind of went on. So years later, this is like two, three years later, I, I asked the question, I was like, hey, how come you don't ever wear your hair like that? I, I kind of like that. And she's like, because you said that you did not like it. And so I didn't ever wear it like that again. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, jerk. Just hit him, jerk. Now why? We've talked about this often. It is because value was placed in my opinion. And because it was placed in my opinion, which remember we all know about opinions from last week, because it was placed in my opinion, her acceptance was based on my opinion. So whenever I said that, it felt like rejection. So for some reason, I felt like, and I'm, let me just tell you this way, it probably wasn't innocent on my part. It was probably like, I like one you, I don't like that hairstyle at all. <laughs> but you know what? None of my business, why? Because my job is to just let them be them in Christ, right? Why? Because all I'm doing is I want you to be what I need you to be. And let me just tell you that. You know what kind of burden that puts on people's lives to be something when they can't be that because you're putting demands on them when they already feel like they're not worthy anyway? And you heap those demands on? So what God is trying to do is relieve those burdens. Why? Because there's only one acceptance and that's in Christ. Okay? Go to Romans chapter nine. Here's the last verse. Romans chapter nine. Watch, this is how cool this is. What should we say then that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained a righteousness, even the righteousness of faith? So it says the Gentiles, oh, the ones without God. They weren't Jews. They weren't those that followed God. He said, how did they get to righteousness even though they didn't pursue it? They weren't even pursuing to try to be right with God and somehow they got it. He said, but Israel pursuing the law of righteousness, they have not attained to the law of righteousness. They were after, they were trying to keep the law. They were doing all these things, trying to make it happen. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, and as in written, Behold in Zion I lay a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him, I left the last part on, will not be put to shame. That's the last part of it. So think about this. It says this, they weren't trying to pursue right standing with God, but they attained it. Why? Because they didn't pursue it by their own efforts. They pursued it by faith in what Jesus did. And he says this, this is how he phrased it. He said, I laid in Zion, or I laid among the people a stumbling stone. And they kept stumbling over it. And here was the stumbling stone. Jesus as their righteousness. Basically saying this, if you believe on him, you are right with God. You come in right standing. You believe the work of the cross. You've now been made righteous. And it was like, we can't accept that because we work really hard at trying to be right with God. And he's like, that's the only way. So how many of you have been working really hard to be in right standing with God and you just call them way short? You're trying to do all these things. And you're trying to work this thing. Trying to do all this stuff. Can I tell you, a relationship with God is supposed to be a restful place. And I know that we can add so much burden on our life through what we believe. So my question is this. Is are you stumbling over Jesus as your Righteousness. Jesus as the source of you being blessed and prosperous in this life. How much of it is based upon what you think you do that he'll come and bless you? Because I'm telling you this, if you're struggling with obeying him in certain areas of your life, it's because you believe that he is measuring your goodness and what he's gonna do for you based on your obedience, based on your, your behavior. You'll be shocked to realize this, and I'm gonna close with this, that the more you trust in what he did on the cross, the more you'll actually start to follow him and do things that are right. When you trust in him and that you don't, you've been forgiven and all these things are paid for, you won't make other people try to pay for those. You'll be able to be kinder to them. Why? Because of the work of Jesus. That's supposed to be the simplicity of this gospel, okay? I want you to stand to your feet.
I want you to just close your eyes just for a moment, if you will, just open up your heart. God is really good. He is really good. I want you to just let the Spirit of God just be kind of, just begin to kind of open up your heart. I want you to just let the Spirit of God just open up your heart. Because I know what happens is many times things kind of weigh us down. And, and I know this morning that the reason why I feel like God put this on my heart, we're going to talk about something next week that's going to really stay connected to this same idea of how we turn prescriptions into obligations. We, return, we turn the things that God prescribes just like tithing, just like forgiveness, just like Bible reading, anything. How we turn those prescriptions into obligations. I want you to know that Jesus simply wanted you to come to him and lay all your troubles at his feet. Receive his righteousness in exchange for letting him carry all the weight of those things. Because let me tell you, he already, he already carried them. So this morning, what I want to ask you to do is just lay that care over on him. Whatever it is. Maybe your relationship's really struggling today in any form. What if you just laid the care over on him? And how will we do that? By saying simply this, Jesus, I, I've been working trying to fix this thing for a long time. I'm gonna simply do this. I'm gonna believe that you paid for my great relationships when you died on that cross. All the insecurities, all the fears, all the concerns I have, all the insecurities, the manipulations I have, I just trust you with them. All the hurts that I've felt, I know that you've healed them. I know all the pains that I've, that I've suffered, you healed them in that cross. That I don't have to carry those. I don't have to let those pains weigh me down another day. Let me just say this to you this morning. Maybe you are the source of someone else's pain. You don't have to carry that anymore because Jesus paid for it. So why don't you just lay that down this morning? Lay it down at the foot of the cross and just accept that. Yeah, but I've hurt some people. Hey, you know what? God will open the door for you to apologize or you to love on them. But just let him do that. Let him open the door. So this morning, just lay that weight down. Father, I pray this morning that no matter what challenges or what areas we are struggling in or we're finding that we're having a hard time trusting you, I pray that you would just open up the windows of heaven and pour out goodness upon this room. I pray for peace over every heart that has felt struggle over the last few months. And I pray that this morning we would just simply choose to believe that what you have done on the cross fulfills and completes me so that I can be free to just be who you've called me to be and love those who you have put in my life. And I thank you for the promises of God this morning. I pray for healing. I want you to do this. If you're sick in your body, I want you to just lay your hands on there. Come on, Jesus paid for that so that you could be healed. He bore that in his body on the tree. Come on, just, just you don't have to do anything. You don't, have to, you don't have to measure it, whether it works or whether or not. You just simply choose to believe that this morning. I choose that this morning. I choose to believe your report and your opinion, God. I choose to believe that, so I just receive it. I choose to believe that you want my finances to be better. I choose to believe that. And I know that you've made a way and that you're gonna lead and guide me in whatever principles, whatever generosity, you're gonna lead me there. I'm not gonna have to worry about it. I'm not gonna have to feel the struggle or the pain or the pressure, but I'm gonna be able to do it from a kind and willing heart. And Father, you know the answer. I pray for forgiveness to work in our hearts. Come on, Jesus paid the price for that pain. Just go ahead and just receive that forgiveness this morning. Let the wounds that the enemy has tried to use as a weapon against you, it says that weapon cannot prosper. So Jesus, we just send that lie away from us right now. We send that lie away from us and we don't believe it. And we accept what it is that you say to us today in Jesus' name. I want you to do this really quick. I want you to just open up your heart and I want you to just receive the gift of righteousness. Come on, just an ever feeling, an infilling of the Holy Spirit just simply means this, that I'm yielding to the Spirit of God. So this morning, just yield to that. Yield to the fact that you're accepted. 
Just yield to the fact that he loves you more than you can possibly imagine. He loves you apart from what you do. He has made a great plan for your life that's far beyond what you could even dare dream or hope. And just dare to believe that this morning. Come on, don't let religion jump in there. Don't let the lies of the enemy jump in there. Just choose to believe that this morning. Father, we just accept what it is that you say. We believe your report of the gospel. And so we just accept it today. We stand upon it and we declare it over our life in Jesus' name. We thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence today and be set free by the blood of Jesus. And we thank you for that today and your work in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe that, say amen. Amen.